The Steve Lobby Agency presents The Christian Publishing Show, a podcast for writers who want to advance Christ's kingdom using the written word. Here's your host, Thomas Umstadt Jr. Here on The Christian Publishing Show, we've been doing a bit of an audio push the last few episodes, and this is a really important topic. And if you haven't yet listened to episode 23 about the future of audio and podcasting, I really encourage you to go back and listen to that episode because audiobooks not only are the future, they also are the past. And I make the case for that back in that episode. And I made the recommendation that every book should be an audiobook. And I just left it at that. And I realized I kind of left some people hanging in terms of it's like, okay, I believe you, my book needs to be an audiobook. But now what? Well, to answer the now what, we have Tom Parks on the show with us today. He has narrated, directed, and produced over four hundred audiobooks by authors, little known authors, like people like Rick Warren and Daniel Steele, who you may have heard of. Uh, And we'll have links to his many books on Audible. Tom, welcome to the Christian Publishing Show. Thank you, Thomas. It's good to be with you today. So walk us through the day in the life of an audiobook narrator. What is it that you do? Um, wow. Um, So there's a lot of, uh, I guess, factors to that. I mean, the, the actual narration of the book itself um, if you were to to watch someone narrate an audiobook, I think it's it's roughly equivalent to watching paint dry. Um, <laughs> I, I have a studio in my home in my basement, and uh, if I'm doing a narration day, my typical day involves uh, rolling out of bed, drinking some coffee, stumbling to the basement in my pajamas, warming up my voice, and I go. And um, you know, it's one of the things that's kind of cool about working from home is you can you can do this. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the narration part is, is really pretty straightforward where it gets a little more involved is, um, I don't think of myself just as a narrator. I I think of myself really as a small business owner who's part of the publishing industry. And so I'm of course, you know, always looking for more work for myself and other narrators that I produce, um, different companies that I work with. Uh, we, we do uh, audiobook proofing um, and uh, engineering and editing and mastering and things like that as well. So so the, there's the business aspect of things. Uh, you know, somebody's got to write the checks and, you know, make sure the bills get paid and invoices are sent out, but then also the actual narration, the research, uh, the process of of doing that. So, like, I, I'm doing a, a book um, that I started on uh, yesterday, and I'll, I'll finish up uh, probably tomorrow morning sometime. It's a brand new book. Uh, it's called Parenting is Hard, uh, and Then You Die. <laughs> yeah, I thought you would appreciate that. And it's by Dave Clark, and um, it'll be about an eight and a half, eight hour, eight and a half hour audio book when it's done. And like I said, I started on it uh, yesterday, finished another project, and then went into his book. I'll record about four and a half, five hours of that book today, and then I'll finish it up in the morning. Yeah, because your voice it is perishable, right? You couldn't record for 18 hours in a day to like cram before a project. What's what's the point where you kind of have to give your uh, voice a break at the end of the day? Like how many hours can you talk into a microphone before needing to rest? Yeah, I'm usually looking at finished hours of audio. And so um, if I get my, my goal is to get between four and a half and five hours of finished audio done. And depending on the kind of book, how weighty the book is, how difficult the book is. I can usually do that in about a seven, seven and a half hour uh, day of working. And, and you know, and I build breaks into my schedule. Uh, some of them are, you know, normal breaks. My, my stomach is growling. I need to go eat something, <laughs> you know, so it doesn't, you know, decide it wants to record along with me. Uh, some of them are interrupted breaks because I am running a business here as well. And so, I get an email that needs response. I need to stop and and take care of that issue or something like that. Um, but you know, I recording wise, you're right. It, there's there's only a, a finite amount that the human voice I think can do. It's like any muscle. The more you use it, the more stamina you have, and the longer it can go. If you're not pushing it hard, uh, you know, some people can run at a ten minute mile pace. And they can run five or six miles easily. But if you push it up to a seven and a half mile pace, you know, they can go maybe a mile and a half, two miles, and then they've got to stop and take a break. The human voice is no different than that. And so 
if I'm doing a nice conversational uh, text that isn't requiring a lot of vo- voices, that isn't requiring a lot of emotion, you know, I can go much longer on that than I can on something that's a much more intense, dramatic kind of read. It makes sense. And your model of kind of being a solopreneur uh, where you have your own studio, that's not like some people listening may be like, oh, that's so weird. You know, when they're thinking audiobook producer, they're thinking some like fancy L.A. studio with like somebody with very expensive glasses sitting behind the glass. And that's not what audio production looks like anymore. No, it really isn't. And I, I did my first book uh, in 2000. I can't remember if it was 2009 or 2010. And uh, I started in a, in a, with a company that's an audiobook uh, uh, production company. And at the time, they had four studios. And I remember uh, there was a push with audio, Audible back in 2011 that they wanted to try to record every book that had ever been written. And um, so this, this studio, which is owned by Amazon, um, increased the number of studios from four to 10. And for about a year, all 10 studios were busy all the time. In fact, they were running some weeks, two shifts. They had a morning shift and an evening shift where you could go in and narrate in the evening. And then about 2014, um, things changed. Um, Audible realized that trying to record every book is a terrible idea. We can argue more about that in a minute. Um, and uh, 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 the price of equipment and things came down and, and narrators uh, realized we can do this at home. Publishers realized it was very expensive to lease studio time or to fly narrators or, or authors uh, to their own studios to record. And so the home studio business really kind of took off. And now I don't have an exact number, but I, I would say that you would probably find far more audiobooks today are being recorded outside of commercial studios than are being recorded in commercial studios. The The lion's share of what you're seeing done on a day in, day out basis is just like me. It's narrators. We've been around for a while. We learned how to narrate. Then we learned how to do the technology. We uh, created space in our homes uh, where we could do this. And... Um, this is where most audiobooks are being recorded now. And that's not just true with audiobooks. It's also true with voiceover actors. So even in L.A., for the voiceover guy who's telling you what to watch at 7 o'clock tonight, uh, you know, tune in. That guy, you may not realize it, but he's chances are recording from his home. But even radio stations, um, you know, uh, uh, a good friend of mine is a station manager at a major uh, Chicago market Christian radio station. And uh, their guy who does their traffic lives in Denver and works out of his home. The guy who does their weather lives in California and works out of his home. And they record all that stuff and then they upload it. And it's part of what's happening at the station in Chicago. That's right. And what's driving this is the fact that the equipment has gotten so cheap. It used to be the reason you had to go into the studio is that there was $100,000 of equipment there and you couldn't reproduce that in your home. But most neighborhoods are actually quieter than most business districts, right? There's less ambient noise to filter out, especially if you're in a basement. Uh, You're in a really ideal situation already in in a very quiet part of the country. And then you add some equipment there and uh, you cut out your commute and you're able to compete on price in a way that a physical studio just can't. That's exactly right. So um, what kind of books do you enjoy narrator? Do you do mostly fiction or nonfiction? What's what's the difference there and, and which do you enjoy more? Yeah, primarily what I do is nonfiction. Um, I do a lot of faith-based. I do a lot of business and uh, uh, business uh, type material. I do some science and technology. Occasionally get into some historical stuff. Um, the audiobook business much is it has really more in 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 um, more closely related to acting than it does say to. Um, traditional voiceover work or something, because what you're looking for is who's the person or what voice can tell the story of the book best. And so producers are always looking at who can, in my case, represent the voice of the author, since I'm doing nonfiction, and who can can best replicate the tone and the style of the author's writing to be able to... Um, best perform that audiobook. And so, you know, from an enjoyment standpoint, I mean, I love the faith-based stuff. 
um, it's it's funny. You and I were talking before we went on the air that you know most evangelical Christianity traces its roots back to Baptist. I'm an Arminian. Uh, I actually <laughs> was a Nazarene pastor for for 24 years, and so it is. It's funny for me because sometimes if I'm uh, narrating an audiobook that's not Arminian, I find in my head I'm I'm arguing ideologically with the author <laughs> as I'm going through. But my job is still to portray what the author believes, what the author has concluded as being true, and to do it in a way that's convincing. And so, like, I've done political stuff, and I've done stuff that's very, very pro-Trump, and I've done some stuff that's very anti-Trump. My job is not to sell one position that I believe versus another. My job is to represent the author and be the author's voice sharing this narrative in a way that is true and faithful to what the author is trying to get across. And there's an advantage to focusing on Christian literature, you know, especially as a former pastor, you take it for granted that you understand how to pronounce Ecclesiastes correctly. <laughs> like imagine somebody who's never been in church trying to pronounce all of the Hebrew and Greek terms that, you know, we may not be pronouncing them, frankly, like when the, the way that they're said in the American church, but we all mispronounce it together. I actually got my first recording gig with a major Christian publisher um, because they had just recorded a, a commentary on the book of Hosea and they used a narrator they had used a lot in the past and it got it was a rush job and it didn't get proofed properly. And it was only after the book had been released that they realized he had said Jose instead of Hosea through the entire commentary. And the producer happened to know an engineer friend of mine, and he said, hey, I know this guy. He's a former pastor, and he could probably do that for you. And that's how I got my first book with that company, was going back and re-recording <laughs> that book for them because I have some facilities with, with you know, uh, being able to handle the Hebrew and Greek and stuff like that. That's really funny. My grandfather did recording for the blind uh, for years, um, and he used to be a medical doctor, and this was like his retirement job, and he focused on doing a lot of scientific books for the blind because he knew his way around the Latin, right? You have to learn, I don't know, a million, a million terms to become a doctor, and you know, you know how to pronounce them, and so it gave him, not competitive advantage is the wrong term because he's donating his time. It's not like he was a professional uh, voiceover actor, but it was that same sort of idea, and as more books are being made into audiobooks, more narrators are focusing where they're, you know, picking little niches and those niches give them an advantage because the pronunciation, the accent is so important and it is hard to you know, look up, you know, the pronunciation on Google for, you know, 250 terms, right? Like that just gives you a competitive disadvantage if you're not uh, inside of that niche. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about what makes for a good audiobook. Do you, you were talking about how not all books should be adapted to audiobooks earlier. I'm curious to hear your argument for that. So what makes a, let's start with what makes a book a bad uh, fit for being adapted to an audiobook? I think that there, there are two major categories that stick out in my mind. One is books that really don't have anything to say. <laughs> uh, they're poorly written. They have, they're, they have no argument to advance. Um, they're not really contributing anything to the conversation, which is probably a larger uh, publishing question you know, whether books, whether everything that's been written should be published. I'm not sure that everything that's been published should be made into an audiobook. But I think that the secondary category to that is there are some books um, that just don't adapt well for audio. Uh, for example, uh, I did a book by a fairly well known Christian author, and the second half of the book was recipes. Mm. And so. You know, the first half of the book was kind of talking about lifestyle change, but the second half of the book was recipes. Let me tell you, there is nothing more exciting than sitting, listening to someone read you four and a half hours of recipes. I know exactly what that's like. I'm reading a book with my wife or listening to a book with my wife, and it has recipes from time to time. It's a book about the history of food in American culture. And the parts about the history of food in American culture are amazing. And then she's like, and here's how to make this historic dish. And we're just like, snooze. <laughs> it's like, this is not the place, right? This is a, a reference type work. It's kind of like in the Bible, listening to the genealogies being listed, right? That's very useful to look up and answer a question. But to hear the names 
a listed one after another, it's a little difficult to listen to for long periods of time. Right. And occasionally you'll get a book, too, that has uh, a lot of charts and data and stuff like that that's embedded in the text. And we try very hard to um, uh, to adapt that for audio. Some of that stuff just doesn't compute. It, it, it's hard to um, it's hard to narrate a spreadsheet. That's right. And although it is a marketing opportunity, and, and for those of you who have books with charts and data, the best practice is to put all of those charts and all those figures into a PDF on your website. And it gives you an opportunity to get the email address uh, of the listener, or at least get them to your website where you can start a, a deeper relationship. But you're right, it is hard. And and sometimes I appreciate it when the narrator kind of takes a step back and kind of in big picture describes the graph, because sometimes it's really easy to just punt and be like, and to see this figure go to so, this author's website forward slash blah, blah, blah. And like, no, make an effort, right? Like, do the numbers go up and to the right? Or do they go down and to the right? Uh, a really fascinating book I listened to uh, that was adapted very interestingly is the book How Music Works, The Science and Psychology of Beautiful Sounds. And it talked about like how sound waves worked. And there were parts of the book where they're explaining notes and how they work. And there's figures that are in the book that we can't see. And like those sections were broken for the audiobook effectively, right? We could maybe go and look them up, but it just didn't adapt well. But there were other parts of the audiobook where they added, here's what this sound actually sounds like. And you could hear it in the headphones and it was actually made better. And it was one of those few books where it's like, you really got to buy both versions for the full experience because neither version alone gives you the full education. Sure. So what makes a book good to narrate? So we talked about what you don't like, like figures and, you know, recipes that make sense. What what uh, makes a book really fun to narrate or a really good uh, fit for adapting to audio? I think that the books where the author has really allowed his or her personality to come through um, really makes for a good book. And, and a book that can take a nonfiction subject, but do it in a story form is outstanding. Um, I did a, a book by Victoria Bruce called Sellout, and it's it's the story of <laughs> it's the story of rare earth minerals. Okay, doesn't that just grab you and sound exciting? Oh, I'm so excited! <laughs> um, but I have to tell you, it's one of the best written, most interesting, most compelling books I've ever narrated because she doesn't just give you the facts and history of rare earth minerals. She she embeds this in the context of a story about this man who wants to buy some hunting ground. And then there's this old abandoned mine and it's got these rare earth minerals as a waste product. And what do I do with those? And then he finds out that the Chinese have basically taken all of the copyrights and patents involving anything that's that's being built using rare earth minerals. And so she develops that story and and lobbying of governments and history. And it's a, it's an incredibly well written book. It's the kind of thing that when you get done, you think this could actually kind of be made into a movie and, and be like a decent movie. But it's a nonfiction book telling the story of rare earth minerals, which on the surface sounds terrible. It's really a very, very great book. Yeah, I mean, a great example of that is the book Moneyball, right? It's a book about not sports, but spreadsheets about sports. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, man, sign me up. I can't wait to read a book about spreadsheets about sports. And yet the book is a New York Times bestselling book. I read it start to finish. They made a movie about a, a book about spreadsheets about sports and, and the narrative really is what gave it power. And this, I think, is a really important principle for those of you listening who are still working on your book is find that way to work a narrative through what you're teaching nonfiction wise. And, you know, God did this with the Bible, right? Like the Bible isn't just the Ten Commandments. It also has a lot of narrative elements. In fact, the New Testament, huge uh, portion of it. And in fact, all the teachings of Jesus are baked into a narrative and uh, and a true narrative. And I, I assume this nonfiction book about the rare earth minerals, that was a true narrative, right? It wasn't a fictional hunting ground. It was an actual hunting ground. Like that was actual lobbying, right? And and it, it, it's so much better and it's it, so much more competitive, right? Because I could look up the Wikipedia page on rare earth minerals and I could find links to the court cases and I could get the data faster online for free. 
if I'm going to read your book, you have to provide something that I couldn't look up on Wikipedia. And that's a perfect example of how to do that. And if I can throw in one other thing when it comes to faith-based books, and this is the former pastor in me that's that's talking, you know, when when I was pastoring, I pastored a blue-collar congregation of people who just didn't read. You know, these, these are people who don't read anything. They don't read the newspaper. They don't read anything. And quite often when I'm reading faith-based stuff, I'm thinking, this is good stuff, but it is written so technically that the average person that I pastored would never even make it past about page three or four. And so the things that the, the, the people are talking about, I think, especially in faith-based publishing, are so vitally important that they have to be presented, I think, in the same way that Jesus did, as you said in the New Testament. It was through parables and the telling of stories and even the Pauline texts are still rooted in something that's actually going on in the lives of the church he was writing to. It was, it was um, content, contextually specific to those groups of people that when they got those letters, they went, oh, yeah, remember, he's talking about Bob here. Um, and, and it was very relevant and remains relevant today. And so much of the faith-based stuff that I record, frankly, uh, it's 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 a little disappointing sometimes because I think, man, you've got a really good idea here, but it's it's so dense and unnecessarily so that it's you're going to have a hard time getting much beyond maybe a core audience of pastors who will be able to understand. If you're trying to reach laity, um, your your challenges are going to be that much harder. And I, and I get frustrated with that because I believe in Christian publishing. I think that Christian publishing is so very vitally important to the ministry of the church as a whole. But we have to find ways of saying these things in ways that narratively uh, are going to engage the current culture that we live in, which is not just biblically illiterate, but in many ways reading less and less unless it has a strong hook to it. Um, to really draw them in. That's really good. And a great book to help you with this. And I use this as an agent uh, when coaching my clients. I've gotten incredible feedback. I've been using this book to train communicators for almost a decade. And it's made to stick. Why some ideas stick and others fail. And it's all about the science behind communication. And Basically, it took 2,000 years, but science has now proven that the way Jesus communicated is the scientifically superior way to communicate. So if you want to hear scientists break down um, Jesus's communication style, like an understanding why the, the red letters are in red in many Bibles, this book, which is not, as far as I know, written by Christians, and it doesn't talk about Jesus in every example, although it could, uh, I, I feel like they had to like ration themselves and use other examples other than just Jesus because it was a uh, more general market book. But it is incredibly helpful, and it's got very specific tips on how to do exactly what you're talking about, how to take complex topics and make them simpler to understand. Because here's the beautiful thing. If you do it well, you don't lose those pastors. The pastors can still understand the simply written um, work and still get benefit from it. But then you're opening yourself up to the bigger, much bigger audience of regular people, which is, frankly, the audience for almost all uh, books that I see. When I, I get all these proposals, almost none of them say this book is only for pastors, right? Some people write just for pastors, but the dream of most authors is they want to uh, write a book that is read by people, <laughs> not just by superhumans or, you know, a academic uh, readers. So uh, what are, now you read books by uh, authors and they're, who choose not to read their book or their publishers choosing not to read their book, but some authors do read their own book for one reason uh, or another, what advice would you have for them in terms of like uh, reading the book well? Yeah, I think that um, <laughs> the knee jerk reaction of the narrator in me wants to say don't, but I won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I work with narrators quite a bit, and I think that if you are thinking about narrating your own book, it certainly behooves you to bring in a director who understands audiobooks to work with you. Don't. Don't just run down to your church sound booth and say, you know, Skippy knows how to use Audacity, and so let's record an audiobook. 
so much of what I'm concentrating on when I'm working with a narrator is how, again, can I get that person's voice to really be heard? Um, I had a, 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 a narr- excuse me, an, an author who actually came to my studio and narrated a book, um, and she had done some books, and they hadn't critically hadn't been really well received. And I went back and listened to some of her books, and like there was no personality. And then I saw some YouTube videos, and I thought, wow, she is a very compelling presence when she's on stage. When she is on stage. She has that room absolutely in the palm of her hand. She's a gifted communicator. And so when she came in to record, you know, I I just kind of talked with her. I tried to make her feel comfortable and at ease and all of that. But I talked to her about how much I wanted to hear her voice. I didn't want her to come in and perform an audio book like she thought it should be. I just wanted to hear her talk. I wanted her personality to come through. And, you know, we had three days together. And there were times when she kind of started slipping back into that old thing. But as a director, I could say, hey, you're, you have such a great story here. I love what you're saying right here, but I don't feel like I hear, I'm hearing you saying it. It's almost like you're just reading someone else's book. And so how can we get your personality back in and make you feel comfortable to talking, you know, and speaking in a way that sounds really like you just telling me what it is that you want me to know from this book? That's really good because the rules are different when you're reading your own book, right? When, uh, Tom, when you're reading somebody else's book, you have to be true to that book and you can't interpret it, right? Like that's breaking the cardinal rule of being a narrator, right? Especially if you disagree with it and you're kind of snickering at the book, like that totally breaks the rules. But if you're the author, it's almost like a, like a painting where the author will embellish the print. So there's a print version, but the actual painter will put uh, paint on that print canvas, uh, you can do that as the author and you can provide commentary. In fact, some authors will break away from the script and comment on the book as they're reading it, almost like a director's commentary or the way that they read it adds meaning that may not be in the original. And that's okay because it's your book. You can get away with it. And when it's done well, you add a lot of emotional resonance. I was listening to and uh, several audiobooks, uh, Christian audiobooks for the Christian Book Awards. And some of the re- narrators would tear up at various points that were just so emotionally powerful for them and their story. And that was good. <laughs> that was like, oh, how dare you? And like, do another take without tears. It's like, no, it's like, I feel you. Like, I'm wanting to cry right along with the character. Whereas if a narrator did that, it might feel a little manipulative. Like, if you were to cry while reading somebody's books, like, I don't know, you you probably couldn't do that take. And so I I really like that advice of bring your whole person to reading your own book uh, and and be present emotionally. And I will say, as somebody who has read my own book, and it was about some painful things in my life, that's hard, right? It's very, it's easier to bring that clinically detached, oh, these terrible things happened to somebody else's life, uh, but to read it with feeling. In some ways, you have to go back and revisit those painful moments of your past, and that can be difficult. Well, sure, and it, and it is exhausting. I mean, it's uh, uh, many er- narrators, uh, authors that I've worked with. When we get done with a day, we'll go. I had no idea, <laughs> um, and I and I've had some narrators who, after they've done a book, have said, "Yeah, I'm probably never going to do that again," um, because it is very different, um, and vocal stamina is different. You know, we're always worried about mouth noises and things like that. And and uh, I think there are things that we as narrators just kind of do intuitively as we go through the process to take care of that. That when you're working as a as a uh, an author, you don't think about, you're not aware of. And again, that's another reason why I think if an author wants to record his or her own book, it's really wise to uh, make the investment to be in a studio that understands audiobooks because it is different than recording music. Uh, or to at least bring in a director who's someone who knows and understands audiobooks to work with the author uh, to just help the book be the best it really can be. Those of us who are directors, that's all we want. We, we want the best performance. And, um, you know, we're trying to create an environment and give coaching that can help whoever the narrator is do that. Has the concept of remote direction taken off in the industry yet where you direct somebody else where like you're listening on Skype and they're recording locally? That's that's happening. 
It absolutely is. In fact, I I, uh, did a book with a well-known congresswoman from California just not long ago. It was one of her memoirs. And uh, her schedule was such that she had two hours this day and three hours next Tuesday and stuff like that. And we did all that by remote, uh, directed her by Skype. Um, I, I work with several narrators in that way. And it's it's really great uh, because you still have that input to be able to do that. You can have that person in a studio that's local to them. Uh, the the challenge in that is, is um, you know, as with many things in the publishing industry, it's the budget. Uh, you know, does the budget sustain uh, uh, bringing in that extra person and doing that. Although I will say a lot of publishers, the first thing they do when they have an author read a book is they have the author fly somewhere else. And then they put up the author in a hotel for three nights uh, during the recording, and then they fly them home. And when you're done with that, that's a thousand dollars or $1,500, depending on what their origin airport is. Uh, so if you don't spend that money, you now have a budget for a director. <laughs> Well, and not only that, but you're taking that author out of their comfort zone to a different place, maybe in a different time zone and in a hotel where they're not maybe going to sleep as well. And all of that's going to be part of the performance, you know, as you're going to hear it in their voice and and all of those kinds of things. So. So, yeah, I think, you know, the more that we can get an author or whoever the narrator is to just be comfortable, the better the performance. That's really good. And I know we have a lot of industry professionals who listen uh, to this show. And I just want to say, I think this is the future. The the whole idea of flying an author to a studio somewhere else, uh, that made sense in the 20th century. It does not make sense in the 21st century. Every city has good recording studios. They're not hard to make. In fact, for that $1,500 that you spent flying that person, you could buy them the equipment for their own home recording studio uh, that wouldn't be half bad. Uh, it makes a much more sense to have them go somewhere locally, like what you're saying, and sleep in their own bed and spend that money on, that you would have spent on the plane and on the hotel and food and all the rest of it on people who are the professionals around that. And it'll allow you to do more books in audio and it'll allow you to do better books in audio. And so, and, and I will say they're still doing that. They're still flying authors to other cities. I know authors just this year, 2019, who flew to a city to record an audio book. And I'm just like shaking my head. It's like, there's such a better way to spend that money. Uh, we're almost out of time, uh, but I do want to ask a couple of quick questions. Um, what are some common mistakes that you hear new narrators make, whether it's a, an author or like the narrators that you're coaching? Uh, what are like the common mistakes? Um, not warming up properly, um, not being consistent with their voices uh, where where you can't necessarily tell where one day ends and the next day begins. Um, um, pacing, reading too fast. That's this is my probably the number one complaint in audiobooks is is uh, people who don't narrate audiobooks read way too fast when they're recording. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we're constantly trying to slow them down. And then the other thing is is coming in and trying to have like a voice instead of just being yourself. Most people listen to audiobooks either in their car or through earbuds. And if if I'm listening to you through earbuds, I don't want you yelling at me. I don't want your big booming voice. Just talk to me. Don't preach at me. Don't pretend you're in the pulpit. Just talk to me like I'm sitting across the table from you or better yet, talk to me like your, you know, voice is six inches from my ear. How would you talk to me if if we were that close and you were telling me that information? Um, and so I think I think for authors just to kind of or, or narrators to just relax and just be themselves and have conversation uh, translates into a good audio book, particularly in the nonfiction field, uh, where we're not thinking so much in terms of the drama of the performance of uh, character voices and things like that. Excellent. That was amazing. Uh, this episode of the Christian Publishing Show is brought to you by the Christian Writers Institute. And the course of the week is how to get published. This is one of our most popular courses, and it's one where yours truly teaches you how to go from being unpublished to being published. And I talk about both the traditional process of getting an agent and an editor and being published through a traditional publishing house and how to do it 
the uh, the independent process where you publish yourself. I talk about the pros and cons of each as well as giving you practical tips along the way. This course is only $20 normally, but you can save 10% with coupon code podcast at checkout or just click the link in the show notes. We have been talking with Tom Parks, professional audiobook narrator and producer. And we will have links uh, to Tom's uh, Facebook page if you want to connect with him there and a list of all of his books on Audible. And real quick, Tom, are you accepting new clients? Like if somebody wanted to work with you to read their book, are, are you open to that or do they need to go through like Audible Studios or something like that? Absolutely. Um, I do a variety of projects for authors directly. I actually just did one yesterday for an individual who purchased the rights to an out of print book and they want it done in audio audio format. And uh, recorded that yesterday. So yeah, there's there's all kinds of ways of working together, and um, this is the joy of being alive in this technologically connected age. Is there are resources to make it possible for individual authors who want their audiobook read and performed by a narrator to do that in a way that that doesn't uh, you know break the bank. All right, excellent. Well, uh, Tom, thank you so much for joining us today on the Christian Publishing Show. Thanks for having me. I hope you have a great uh, great day and great week. Thank you for listening to The Christian Publishing Show. For more information and to get episodes delivered to your phone automatically, visit christianpublishingshow.com.